Uh, because you were nice enough to let me come and speak with you, I want to share with you the secret to happiness. <laughs> and the secret to happiness, once you see, now it's not in your materials because I kept this out. All right, it's a secret. I can't let this out. I'm about to give you the secret to happiness. The secret to happiness is a three-prong test. And I think you will agree, once you see these three prongs, if you could get all three of these things working for you, there is no end to how happy you could be. Have I built this up enough? Yeah. Here is the secret to happiness. Self-delusion, <laughs> hypocrisy, and ignorance. Now, I sensed you were hoping for something different, <laughs> but unfortunately, this really is it. Think of, think of the happiest person you know. The happiest person you know is a relative, hopefully an, hopefully an in-law, because this guy didn't get up till around 1 o'clock today, did he? Because he doesn't have to get up early, because having a job is not something he expects of himself, right? He has had jobs, but he's gotten fired. And when he gets fired, whose fault is it? Somebody else's fault. You want to talk about the recipe for happiness, you get fired and it's not your fault? Let me contrast this with you. If 99% of what you did this week, you did well, 1% you muddled it up, what are you going to spend the weekend thinking about? The 1% you muddled up? That's the recipe for success, not the recipe for happiness. Right? The recipe for happiness is you get fired and blame somebody else. Wife left me. Ah, I never liked her anyway. Right? Bank repossesses the car. Crooked bank. All the fine print. That's the problem there. Apparently you have to make the payments. Right? The state takes away the driver's license for not, well, don't have a car anyway. Somehow they always have TV and beer, don't they? It's amazing how that, that works out in a cell phone. They do, and they get one before you. Yeah, it's just, just amazing. And then, and then the thing that kills me is they will go to a family reunion and criticize people who have jobs and take care of their children. And when you can't take it anymore and you point out that they're ignorant, they clarify that it is, in fact, you who are ignorant and not them. Right? Isn't it amazing? And there's two things that bother me the most. And maybe you're like me. The second most annoying thing is they're happy. You know? <laughs> What are you and I worried about? Worried about our job, doing a good job, worried about my kids, worried about the economy. I'm worried about world peace. What are they worried about? Nothing. <laughs> but isn't there one thing even more annoying than that? Isn't it more annoying how much bigger their TV is than yours? <laughs> It's like I go visit my brother-in-law, it's like, did you steal this from Nike Town? Because this is the biggest TV screen, and how did you get it in this mobile home? Because it appears you had to build the mobile home around the TV. Seems to me to be the only way you could have possibly got, gotten that in there. But of course, I told you, you got to bear with me for a little while. The point of the story is, I found a study that shows that which we've always suspected, ignorance really is bliss. And here's how they proved it. They went around and tested people for competency, and they did a lot of different competencies. And regardless of which competency they tested, the results came out the same. So since I sit before a lot of people interested in accounting, say we go into an organization with 1,000 accountants, and we give them a test, any kind of test you want, and you ask people to guess, where do you think you will fall on a percentile when they grade this thing? And what they found is, the people who score in the top 10%, the very best people underestimate their ability. So the people who score in the top 10% guess they're going to be at the 66th percentile. So they guess one out of three people is better than me. If you think about it, back to school, remember those people who got an A in every single test they ever took? When they walk out of the test and you say, how did it go? What do they say? Oh, it's horrible. I'm ruining my A. Oh, look, another A. Right? You, can tell, you can tell from my tone, I never had this problem. Right? Get, getting an A every time was not something I personally struggled with. But it may have been you, and it, it certainly we all knew somebody who got an A every single time. Right? So I read in the study, what do these very smart people think? Here's what they think. Guess what it is? Wonder, worry, and doubt. I'm taking a multiple choice test. I think the answer is A for this reason. And this kind of supports it too. But this not sure of. B is probably wrong for this reason, but I'm not sure of that. So smart people know there's a lot to worry about. So when they're done, they know they don't know at all. So they think, well, I'm not sure on a bunch of them. I can't possibly get an A. But of course, you know much more than you think you do. So look, another A. Right now, 
I mentioned I never had this problem. My strategy in multiple choice went more like this. Look, four C's in a row. Yeah. There's no way there's going to be another C, right? I don't think I would have graduated without that. Degree. So the minute I became a professor, a professor, I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put eight C's just to freak them out. But of course, the modern student can't get that many right, so they didn't see the pattern. Don't worry about that. <laughs> so it really isn't. It really isn't the guy who scored in the top 10% that you wanted to hear about, though, is it? What about those people who scored in the bottom 10%? You guessed it. People who do things badly are supremely confident in their abilities. More confident, in fact, than people who do things well. Not only do they reach erroneous conclusions, make unfortunate choices, but their incompetence robs them of the ability to realize it. <laughs> the people who score in the bottom 10%, almost every single one projects themselves in the top 20%. The worst people think they're in the top 20%. The top 10% think that one out of three people is smarter than them. This explains our society, doesn't it? Yeah. Right? This certainly cleared up a mystery to me as a professor because for years, the bad students would come in my office and they'd be mystified what was wrong. And they'd come in my So for years, for 18 years till I found this study, I'm sitting in my office and this is what happened. Student comes in. Boy, I did real bad on your test. I'm like, well, first of all, you did badly. And then they always come back. And then they always come back with, do what? <laughs> well, it's an ad for modifying. Never mind. You just, how bad was it? They say, well, I got a 32. And I said, you got 32 out of 100 on a multiple choice test. What went wrong? Well, I don't know. I thought I was going to get an A, just like the study says, right? And for years, I'm like, yeah, but you didn't. Now that you're looking at the test, I don't know. I, 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 but you thought you knew it. You said it, I heard it, I knew it. Like, but now that you see the answer, don't you see you don't see it? Their ignorance robs them of They don't know enough to know that they don't know it. Right now, think about this. If you're in my class, it is my job to make you successful, not happy. So I got to break through this self-delusion. So I said, look, you got 32 out of 100 on a multiple choice test. I said, do, do you understand a monkey would have got a 25? Right, just, just because the kid could be thinking I'm a third of the way home. Not really. You beat the monkey by seven. That's where we are. Matter of fact, a lucky monkey could have beaten you. Statistically, if 11 monkeys took the test, one of them would have randomly gotten more than a 32. Right? You know what they come out with next? Well, I've always been a bad test taker. And the problem is we have accepted this as an excuse in our society when there's no such thing as a bad test taker. If you tell me you're bad at baseball, fair enough. A little ball's coming in, you're trying to hit it with a bat, that's hand-eye coordination. But on a test, the answers aren't moving. You're not a bad test taker, you're a bad answer getter. And it's because you don't know what the answers are. That's what the problem is, right? But here's the thing. If an A student gets an 88% on my test, do you know what they do? They get a bag because they're hyperventilating. They look in the mirror, they cancel social engagements, they look in the mirror and say, what's wrong with me, and start studying harder. If you get 32 out of 100, whose fault is it you're flunking? It's me. And then on the student evaluation, when they get to evaluate their professor, they put zeros. And then they write down, your ex sucks, and spell it wrong. <laughs> so they get a 32, and he didn't teach me nothing. You know, and, and it's my fault. And this wouldn't be a problem, because I've been here a long time. But I have a bet with four of my colleagues. And we have a bet of who is going to get the highest evaluations from the, from the students each semester. And the way it works is, you get the, we get this overall grade. And whichever of the five has the highest evaluation from the students, the four losers have to buy a round of lunch to start each semester. So if you have the highest evaluations from the students, you have bragging rights over your four best friends and four free lunches, it's a big deal, right? And we all try to game the system, tell me if you think this is unethical. Because maybe, maybe it is. But the university gives us the evaluation form at midterm, and we get to pick which day over a five-week period that we choose to give the evaluation. And we all try to pick the day we believe will be the best day. So one of my friends believes familiarity breeds contempt. The day he gets them, he gives it. 
right? Because he believes every day the semester goes on, students are turning on him. And he wants, <laughs> he wants the vote counted as soon as possible. Another friend believes hope springs eternal. He gives it the day before a test because it's the farthest since the last test, and he thinks they think they'll do well on this next test, right? Two of them are gamblers. And I used to be a gambler. And if you're a gambler, you carry those things around. And what you're waiting for is cold and rain. Because when it's cold and rainy, attendance is down. And then you think to yourself, well, which students skip just because it's raining? <laughs> My research shows that A and B students are waterproof and insulated and able to come out in any weather to class. So you're carrying them around when attendance is down, that's when you give it out and the zeroers aren't there. And of course, you know, weather doesn't always cooperate and sometimes you get clobbered, right? But now, as I mentioned, I found this study about nine years ago for the first time and after finding this study, I got an idea. When should you give the student evaluation form? During the test. Because during the test, the moron thinks he's getting an A. <laughs> right? So he thinks he's getting an A. Your ex not so bad. 32, damn, too late, the vote is counted. Right? So at the moment you filled out the evaluation, you thought you were getting an A. So I did this nine years ago for the first time, and it was the highest evaluations I'd ever had in my entire career by a significant amount. I got my free lunches. My friends looked at me and said, he doesn't seem any more charming. <laughs> of course, I'm not any more charming. The secret to my success is the moron thinks he's getting an A, right? So while I'm telling the story, things are going through your mind. Some of you are sitting out there going, uh-oh, what if it's me? What if I'm the one who doesn't know anything? I don't know this, I don't know that, I'm not sure about that. If, I, if this story was making you nervous, don't worry, it's not you, right? <laughs> you're the one who's wondering, worrying, and doubting. If, on the other hand, you're sitting there saying, it is definitely not me, sadly it is you, right? It is exactly the opposite of what we would have guessed. So the very first thing I said to you this afternoon was, who are these people who stand up in our society and say, you should be ethical just like me? Right? If, you know, other people would think, oh, oh, well, you know, I once took a pen home. I'm not too sure about this. Maybe I'm playing favorites, right? If you wonder and worry and doubt, you don't want to hold yourself out as the model upon which everybody else should match. And that ultimately, right, is, is the message. And the message is you raise awareness by wondering, worrying, and doubting.